Okay, so here's the second part of the lesson today. We're down on number two of the potato chip problem. We're now going to look at how you calculate the probability of a type two error. First of all, we have to assume an alpha level of 0.05, and then you'll see these two normal models, and this is kind of interesting, so you have to follow me here, it's very theoretical. But let's assume that the one on the left is what the sampling distribution would look like if in fact, the null hypothesis is true. So if the null hypothesis is true, we're going to say this is what the sampling distribution would look like. So if the null hypothesis is true, it's going to be centered on 8%. But of course, it's possible that HO is not true. Maybe the potato trucks that are coming in Maybe they're coming from a different farm or something like that, and maybe that farm is not as careful about harvesting and delivering in a timely manner. So what if the truth was actually that it was maybe 11%? Maybe these trucks that are coming in are actually looking like that. So the distribution of trucks might look like that. So we're kind of making a, a what if. So what if we thought this is what was true, but in reality, this is what was true. We thought trucks were coming in at 8% blemished, but really what's coming in are trucks that are 11% blemished. So we're, we're imagining a scenario where maybe this is what's going on. So all of our decisions are being made off of this, but perhaps this is what's true. <laughs> So it's, it's kind of complicated to think about that, but it helps to have two normal models sitting side by side. And these are both sampling distributions that we're pondering here. All right, so let's, let's consider this. If the alpha level is 0.05, one way to think about that is that means that if we land anywhere in the top 5%, so if our sample proportion lands anywhere out... I'm going to exaggerate it just a little bit. Let's say, um, let's say this tail right here is the five percent rejection area. So remember, this is a this this entire normal model right there. This normal model is what a sampling distribution would look like if the null is true, and any sample proportions. You know, these these are all sample proportions piling up under here. That's what a sampling distribution is. And everything's good if a truck comes in and these p-hats, you know, are all here, all here, all here. But as soon as you get a p-hat that lands over here, we're going to say, ooh, that's too many. We're going to reject the null because that would put it in the top 5%, which is the rejection area. When alpha is 5%, we're going to reject basically the top 5% of all trucks that come in as far as blemishes. So... That's a nice picture that we need to have here. That's uh, showing us the rejection region. But what we want to do now is we want to expand that, that uh, boundary line kind of upward because we want to remember that we're under the assumption of the model on the left, but it's possible that the truth is the one on the right. But no matter what the truth is, anything, any P hat that lands on this side of that line it's going to cause us to reject the null hypothesis. Any p hat that lands to the right of that line, wherever it happens to be, it looks like it's around 10% maybe or something. So whatever that boundary line is, anything that lands to the right, we're going to reject. And any sample proportion that lands over here, we do not reject the null. So that's just a label. We're going to label that boundary line, and that's kind of the decision line or the alpha level. And so the first question I have is, what's the probability of a type 1 error? This should be easy because we covered this last time. The probability of a type 1 error is the probability of rejecting a null when it's really true, and that's the probability of landing out out in this area out here and that's exactly the same as alpha we learned that the other day so that's a pretty easy thing to figure out as long as you know the alpha level you know the probability of making a type 1 error 5% of p hats are going to land out there just randomly and it will be a mistake 
if the null is true. But now we want to address this next thing. The probability of a type 2 error is a little more complicated. That's the exact opposite of a type 1 error. Remember, a type 2 error is not rejecting a false null. In other words, not rejecting when the null is actually, when the null is actually false. So where would that be? Where on this picture would be the area where you would reject, or sorry, where you would not reject a null, but it would be because the truth is a different model? So if you look at this, this diagram, there's a place where I could shade with a different color that would show you the percentage of time where you would not reject the null hypothesis but you should be rejecting because the truth is that it's 11%, not 8%. So if you look at our line here, we're told that we're not going to reject any time we land over on this side. So when we land on this side, we are not going to reject the null hypothesis. So if we're trying to shade in an area where we're not rejecting, it has to be to the left of that vertical red line. But it also has to be that we have a false null hypothesis. Well, this, this model right here is the model for a false null hypothesis. It's 11%. So it turns out the probability of a type 2 error is right here. When trucks are really 11%, we decide not to reject. That's the area that we would have to calculate to find what the type 2 probability is. We would, we would not reject the null, so we would have to be to the left of that vertical line, but then we would be under the truth model. The truth model could be that it's really 11% blemishes coming in. So that's a picture of the probability of a type 2 error compared to a type 1 error. So this blue shaded region is the, is the the physical, I guess, or the picture, it's, it's the area in the picture that represents a type 2 error. So one of the things that you want to get in your mind is those are on opposite sides of the rejection line. Type 1 is on the right side, so this is the probability of a type 1 error. And on the left side is the probability of a type 1 error. This area right here is Actually, I should have said the probability of a type 2 error. And over here, this would be technically the probability of a type 1 error, because both of those numbers are percentages. So just know that those are on opposite sides of the rejection line. And what, what's important about that is, what if we just decided, you know, let's change our alpha level. I'm not comfortable with 5%. Let's make it 1%. Well, okay, you can do that. If you want to make that 1%, what you're going to have to do, of course, is you're going to have to move this decision line to the right. You can just decide to do that. You can change the alpha level. You can move that to the right so that this area right here goes down. But you just have to realize that when you move that decision line to the right, you're also going to be increasing this area. You're going to be increasing the probability of a type 2 error. So one of the things you can get off this diagram is, is that when you when you reduce the level of significance, you reduce alpha, it's going to increase the probability of a type 2 error. And that's a trade-off. You know, you get rid you reduce one error, but you increase the other error. So you just need to know that anytime you do something to affect one of those type errors, it's going to affect the other one in the opposite direction. So that's a that's a principle that you can bring out of this. Now the question might be: is there any way to actually calculate what is this number? Is it 10%, 20%, 30%? What is the probability of a type 2 error? Well, we can figure that out because the area is under a normal model. And if the area is under a normal model, we should be able to use normal CDF to find the area. So under this problem, we could totally do that. We just have to know some of the parameters. The left boundary of that blue area is basically negative infinity. The right boundary of that blue area is a number that I calculated um, using another procedure. That was around 
I think. It turned out to be 10%. And then we want to put in the mean. The mean is actually 11% because we're under that second model. And the standard deviation is, again, from a formula that we could look up. You know, we'd have to use the square root of 11 times 1 minus 11% all over the sample size, which I think was 500 in this case. So we would use that little formula. That's how we would get 0 0.04 or 0 0.004. So in this case, the probability turned out to be like 23, almost 24%. So we could calculate that if we had to because we've got all the things we need to calculate it. I don't think I've ever seen a problem on the AP test where students had to calculate that from scratch like we just did there. But it's not that hard if you have all the formulas that you need. And then I'm going to throw in one more thing just because I got the picture here, and that's the concept of power. That comes up a little bit later. Power is an interesting idea, and it's a very important statistic. Power is the probability of rejecting a false null. Which, by the way, that's a good thing. <laughs> that's what we should do. Power is a good thing. We want to, or we should be, rejecting a null hypothesis if it's really false. So where would power be? In this diagram, where is the area where you reject a null hypothesis and you should be rejecting a null hypothesis because the null is not true? Well, if you're going to reject, remember you've got to be on the, on the right side of this, this red line, so we've got to be over here somewhere. But we have to be doing it under the assumption that the null is false. Well, if the null is false, that means you know it's this other model. So power is over here. Power is to the right of that rejection line, but it's also under the truth model. So what you can see here very clearly is that type 2 errors and power are complements. They add up to 100%. The type 2 error is on the left half of that normal model. The power is all the rest of it. Those are complementary. So another principle that we can write down, or I guess it's just a formula, the probability of a type 2 error can also be described as 100% or 1 minus power, and vice versa. Power is 1 minus a type 2 error. A type 2 error probability is 1 minus power. Those are complementary probabilities. They have to add up to 100%. So once again, you know, if you imagine messing with the alpha level, which you can do if you want to make that go down, that's fine. But if you make the alpha level go down, you're also going to be making power go down. Because when you move this red decision line to the right, you're going to be decreasing power, and that's a bad thing. But that's the trade-off. You can reduce the probability of a type 1 error, but at the same time, you're going to be reducing power, which is a good thing. So this is a very complicated diagram. There's a version of this in your textbook as well, but I thought it would be good to show the steps of where everything came from. And the bottom line is to kind of know these principles. Know that alpha is the probability of a type 1 error, and know that power and type 2 are complementary. Those are the big, big things. And if you can have this picture in your mind, then maybe you can answer questions about different things. One of the things sometimes they, they will ask students is how can we increase power? Because it's a good thing. Power is a good thing. And how can you increase the likelihood that you are going to reject a false null hypothesis? Which in the world of potatoes and quality control, that means you're increasing your ability to detect a bad truck when it comes in. And that's a very good thing to know. How can you increase power? How can you increase your chance of rejecting a bad truck when it pulls into dump into your factory? Well, there's two ways. Number one, <laughs> we could just move that line over. We could move that line to the left, and if we did that, we would be uh, increasing alpha. So if you increase alpha, you're going to increase power because alpha and power, remember alpha and power, are on the same side of that red decision line. So if you increase alpha, you're going to increase power. That's one thing you can do. And now, just from common sense, you know, if you go into the back of a great big semi-truck of potatoes and you're trying to detect if there are over 8% blemished potatoes, 
let's say you went in there and you grabbed two whole potatoes. That was your sample size. You go in there and you grab two potatoes. Are you going to be able to detect whether that truck's bad or not? No. What if you grab 10 potatoes? Are you going to have a better chance of rejecting a bad truck? Yeah. What if you had 100 potatoes? Oh, much better. If you had 500 potatoes, oh yeah. If you had 500 potatoes, you could detect a bad truck way easier than just picking 10 or 100. So I hope you can tell that increasing your sample size, when you increase your sample size, you'll, be, you'll have a better chance of detecting if you have a bad truck, if you have over 8% blemished. So those are the two main ways that we would answer how to increase power, either increase alpha or increase your sample size. And that's, uh, those are both, those both have a cost, obviously, but that's how you can increase power if you have to. So that's another kind of deep thing. And I know this was a little long, but these are two important lessons in 9.2. And again, because this is the first time we've ever done a hypothesis test, it will be a little long. It'll be a little new. And so once we do this down the road two or three or four or five times, it will become much more easy and understandable. It'll slow down for you. So hang in there with it and always ask questions when you get stuck on something. That's the best way to, to get out of your stuckness. And um, I will see you in class soon, I hope.